The mission of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition is to ensure that children with inattentive ADHD are diagnosed by the age of 8 and that adults with inattentive ADHD receive prompt and accurate diagnosis when seeking help. To learn more about our mission and how you can help, visit iadhd.org. Hello, we're talking with Henry Spett today. I'm Catherine Ellison. I'm a journalist and author. Henry, where are we talking to you from? I'm right now on the Wildflower Beef Farm, Blenheim, Ontario. It's about an hour from Detroit. Okay. We want to ask you about your diagnosis and what it has meant in your life. And it, hopefully we'll have some time to ask about those bees. When were you diagnosed? You were diagnosed with inattentive ADHD, correct? It was probably in my early 40s. I was a clinician at the time and trying to develop protocols to assess ADHD. I traveled to Florida and Dr. Robert Thatcher had a program there where he was a teaching clinicians how to use a neuroimaging to help diagnose traumatic brain injury and ADHD. What? They wanted volunteers to do the brain image. I volunteered myself. And when they looked at the brain, they went, oh man, and I was thinking, <laughs> what is it? And it was clearly the inattentive D plus all the lifetime symptoms I had. It wasn't just that, but that confirmed it for me. I knew something was wrong, but I really didn't know what was wrong. Did you know something? What was giving you the idea that something? Oh, man. Teachers very early in life. The biggest problem I had was the huge up and downs in performance. I What was frustrating is I felt like I was working just as hard. So I started to question, there's something wrong. What I did, unfortunately, was basically checked out of school. Huh. Just survived. I did whatever I could to survive. I didn't care to apply myself anymore. I gave up probably about grade 10. I think that happens a lot. It was tough. It was a tough period, yeah. academically. And yet you did well enough to become a psychologist later I on. barely got through high school. I graduated with a 60.1% and magically was accepted at University of Western Ontario because I only wanted to play football. I didn't really care about school. I, I didn't go to class much. Miraculously, I graduated Western with a BA in health and physical education. Got a teaching degree so I could play another year of football. Stumbled and bumbled my way into a job working with street kids and found out I really was doing more therapy than teaching. I went back to school. I was married, two children, went to Michigan State and got a PhD in psych in two years because there was some pressure on me. Wow. And the kids so started, inspired you? The kids th that you were helping in this job is what? Well, it was a horrific, it was children who lived on the street, which shouldn't have been happening, who were kicked out of school at the age of 12, 13 and above. I started advocating for them as a write about advocacy, even before I went back to school. I wanted to understand what motivated you to become a psychologist. Do you think part of it might have been that you were aware of something going on? Part of it was my family history. I had some difficulty in family and was always helping. I've always been a helper with the street kids. I realized I could really help if I had more training. I quit my job to go back to school with two young children. And uh, that's and it amazing. Was yeah. Very good. Scary time. I bet it was. But yeah. you managed to do all that. How did you control your ADHD while you were in graduate school? A great wife, Mary, who always kept me focused on goals and tasks, a lot of motivation. I think for me, the fear with having two children and knowing I had to do it in two years, which made me focus more than ever in my life. I love going mm -hmm. back to school. I found is even though I was up and down a lot with my performance, because I was so honed in by the fear. The great like, motivator. Your yeah. brain keeps, keeps you going. I was lucky. I was very fortunate. You've been lucky to be so afraid. When you look back at your childhood, do you wish that some teacher could have caught the fact that you actually had something going on? Weren't just lazy? That's a great question. Most people didn't take the time to really figure out what was going on or see anything there of value. And you I just think got that, negative feedback for your uneven performance. Sure, I think part of that is good because it toughens you up. And you start to do things for yourself, not other people. A professor told me that you don't have the brains or what it takes to be in my program. My committee in my master's program sat me down and said, we don't want you to do research because we don't think you're smart enough. But if you do it, we want you to promise you'll never go to a PhD program because you just don't have it. Oh, my God. You know, I was an adult. Married How did you respond to that? I moment? just 
smiled. I did it anyway. <laughs> Finally realized that they were wrong. It wasn't about them. It was just about me always trying to search to get the best out of myself. That became important. So I'm just wondering if you could go back in time. Do you think that it would have made a big difference in your life? Or do you think this having ADHD, turning off of school and then coming back to it made you tougher and more successful? It would have helped me understand. I don't know if it would have changed the outcome. What would that have done for you? Would that have put your life in a different direction? Less anxiety. Even yeah, when I played sure. football, we had a playoff game and I was the most valuable player. But the next game, I really sucked. That up and down in classroom. I remember in high school getting an A plus and then getting a C minus. If I'd known the reason early, it would have been helpful. What did it do for you once you were diagnosed? How did you feel to get that diagnosis? It was such a great feeling to understand mm -hmm. what was going on and learning what to do about it. Sometimes I'm like anybody else. I don't work hard enough or I would goof off or whatever, but knowing what I could do to get to be exceptional was really important for me. It's really important to do your best, but it's also important to win. It's really hard to win when you don't understand the game, what the rules are, how to get an A, how to get a great grade in class or how to become the best you can be. Once I knew that, it unlocked the door for me. Interesting. So what do you do? Do you take medication for your ADHD right now? No, what I do is I have a real strict routine. I get up at five in the morning. Every, single, every single day? <laughs> every day. I start with gratitude. So I, I take four or five things I'm grateful for before I even get out of bed. Then I do the usual morning routine coffee, find out what's going on in the world, do some reading. And then I start with a prescriptive exercise, oh. cardio plus some weight training. Oh, the I cardio understand. gets my brain focused for three to four hours. I've been doing this for over 10 years. Over time... The actual long-term cognitive performance improves, even though hmm. I'm getting older. From when weight training or from cardio? I think it's the cardio. And so what happens is, instead of 2,000 new brain cells a day, we create 4,000 when we hmm. exercise. So over 10 years, hopefully I'm gaining a few. And I'm finding that my performance cognitively for the next three hours is better than it's ever been. For example, I was working on a document for an attorney. We're fighting an environmental thing about our our environmental ecosystem thing here on the farm. So I'm helping the attorney create the brief. So I was writing that today. Then I went out and did B observations, then B videos, studied that, did some research, and now I'm talking to you. That's pretty interesting. And between psychologist and beekeeper, you also had some financial huge success with the stock market? I started to taking real estate very seriously. So my wife and I became serious real estate investors probably 20 years ago. And because of that, we were able to be fortunate. And there's only two things I'm good at. One is real estate and investments, but also honeybee research. So what I found with the ADHD, once you put a box around what you're focused on and you can really get to it, you can do exceptional things. I've accepted. The big thing was to accept that you're only good at a couple of things. Let other people do all the other stuff. Sounds like you're good at a lot of things, though. You've had quite a varied kind of lifespan. The ADHD really makes you get bored, so you pick up other things. Over time, as you mature, you learn that your brain gets better with the cardio exercise. You start to learn if I really focus on, say, it's real estate or beekeeping, you focus on that so much that everything else is tuned out, and you can get an incredible bursts of focus, which when added up equals exceptional outcomes. I agree. But is there anything else that you do? Any other strategies to manage? I try to eat healthy. When I'm with my bees, I watch the bees. I don't interfere much. I have 47 hives. We don't do it for honey. We do it for research. We're trying to create a strain of bees that can take care of themselves without human intervention. Right. When I go watch, you have to get your brain in a place so you can be calm because they pick up nervousness, anxiety. That's they pick so up all of that and they will yeah. not be happy. You teach yourself to relax. I do that for hours, a couple hours a day. I call it a meditation and, and the smell and of the hives and the sounds. I've learned if something's wrong or if they're happy, if they're angry, if they lost their queen and they're depressed. Well, it sounds as if you've managed to combat that anxiety that was maybe a product of the ADHD early on, purely with this kind of structured life and exercise. Yeah, I'd find without the structure and the prescriptive exercise, everything goes off kilter. The self-esteem takes a beating. All those teachers from 
grade one. I can still remember like it was yesterday being kept in at recess because I couldn't color properly. It sounds <laughs> stupid. I'm 67, right? But uh, it's like yesterday. And so the self-esteem takes a beating. It wasn't until three years ago, I really thought I was good at anything. Oh, wow. Wow. To the imposters. I have some notes about an imposter syndrome that you feel sometimes. I love crisis in the sense of I can handle that. But when things are good, I feel guilty. I don't know how to handle success. And you think that comes from the teacher's reactions to you? It comes from an initial lack of practice. If you're used to dealing with negative stuff, you get mm. good at it. No. When you're not used to positive stuff, you go, this shouldn't be happening. This is weird. Even with real estate, I've had some amazing success, 20 or 30 deals that were incredible and were win-win situations. But I kept saying, can anybody see this? Like, why is this not? It's still hard. It's still a daily challenge. Do you connect that to your ADHD? Because there is that hunter gap idea. I think people with ADHD also have that other sense. When I talked about the bees picking up that sense, humans, if we let ourselves, we can pick up that sense too. We know very quickly safety, trust, not able to do that. And very quickly, I found myself having confidence in that feeling. In your gut, what your gut's telling you, right? Yeah. Gut and actually a feeling, like you get a feeling with it that, do you get that? Yeah. Uh, my parents used to always tell me, you're too sensitive. And I think that sensitivity is a strength. Which you probably know, became why I became a clinician. I think we saw over 12,000 people before I handed it off. Right. And I won't remember a name, but if I saw one of those 12,000 faces, I would automatically know the file. Wow. Which is not a good thing in a small community. <laughs> yes, that's sure. Oh, did a lot did. of them have ADHD? Was um, that a specialty of yours? I spent a lot of time with young people and older adults and gifted older adults with ADHD. So we did a lot of complex ADHD. We would learn everything about the person. And most of it was complex. Lawyers, doctors, business people who had ADHD. And also regular folks who didn't quite get it. Once you unlock it, the success was incredible. I always look for strengths, right? Yeah. We've had so many of those cases where people saw that ability and that incredible potential. That was really gratifying to see in the clinics. I think it's so interesting, your interest in street kids, because I did some volunteering at Juvenile Hall and 80% of them have some sort of learning disorder. It's the reason they're in trouble. It's not just poverty. It's the kids who get caught. And so, so many were gifted. I yeah. mean, these were incredible young people. And I always saw them with strengths. Then you would go to the high school and they would talk about all the negative. That's why I want to bring you back to when you were going through school. I think that some boys were being diagnosed back when you were in school. It must have been the, what, 60s? Yep. So what do you think it was that you had the inattentive form and that your symptoms just weren't that obvious or why didn't somebody catch it? I had some skills. I was a straight A student till about grade nine. That's common. And then I just dropped from 80 to 70 to whatever. I think the ability and plus there was a lot of self force control. If I got in trouble at school, I get more trouble at home. Yeah. I can't let my parents find out. I would force myself to sit there. I also had a problem getting my thoughts on paper. So I'd go into the geography class. I'll never forget it. Five boards to write down from the board onto a page was the class in high school. Yeah. Couldn't do it. Did you see other kids around you, like boys who were more active getting diagnosed or getting some help? I did see some get, but we didn't know much about it. I had the parental push to behave. Yeah. A lot of my high school football buddies, they didn't have that. So they would, in grade nine, they would drink. Yeah. Or they would yeah. smoke pot or they would do something to get through. Whereas I was just trying to just control myself. Fear so, has been the motivator. Fear has been the constant. It was <laughs> Not brutal. much now. Yeah. It was, and of course, later in high school, it became alcohol. That's what everybody did to get through it. In college, it was just get through it to play sports. I never really applied myself until I got married and things got serious. <laughs> what was the book you wrote with your son? Josh, my son has ADD and it's called The ADHD Fix, 15 Strategies to Get Through ADHD. I was very fortunate to have the skills to help him 
he's a self-advocate. He's very successful. I've written a, a parenting book, a couple finance books, and I learned from them. When I wrote The ADHD Fix, it really helped me clarify the 15 strategies I needed to reach my potential. So that's why I did it. So we end on an uplifting note. Can you tell us a couple of those strategies? The most important for me was the self-task matching exercise to define how I'm focused. We'd say zero is focused, 10 is out to lunch. We would rate the level needed to do the work effectively. If I'm doing the paper I was writing this morning, I have to be between a zero and two. Uh -huh. If I'm not, I have a couple choices. I can exercise more or leave it until I'm a zero to two to do it effectively. My problem was I was always doing things that were mismatched with my focus. And once I start matching things up, I'm a killer. <laughs> you develop strategies and things to do at different levels. So if you're a zero to 10 and you have a two moment, you better do that boring editing because you don't know how long it's going to last. Right. In an hour, you might be a seven, which is the time you might do dumb research and just looking on the internet. Right. <laughs> it's taking advantage of those opportunities when you're really focused. And then you can work for an hour and do eight hours of work. Do you take medication as well? No, I don't. Uh -huh. yeah, no, I'm lucky. Didn't feel like you needed it or? Yeah, you are lucky. I put so much structure and I work hard at the cardiovascular. The science says if, if you do prescriptive exercise for three or four hours, your brain looks like a non a person. The problem is we all hate to exercise. I hate exercise. No, oh, I love it. <laughs> I love how it makes me feel. So I'm motivated. I never liked it, but I do it every day because I know the incredible outcome cognitively for it. I've been able to do that and, and put the structure. As an entrepreneur, you pretty much set your own schedule. Yes. You decide how and when you work. When I worked with clients, it was very motivating and focused. Every 45 minutes, I had a new problem to deal with. If you have ADHD and you have 12 different people coming through during a day as a clinician and everyone has a different, exciting thing, <laughs> it really helps keep you focused. I bet. I bet. One of the things I'd like people to remember is the issue of self-esteem. A lot of the battles are within us. We all have the experiences with teachers and people that didn't understand us. I always turn it on myself and say, it's a challenge for me to overcome that challenge. Life's not fair and bad things happen to good people. Children need to have someone advocate for them. And my heart goes out to young people who don't have someone. We're talking about situations where children are kept in at recess. Right. Ridiculous, criminal, right. should never right. happen. Teachers who say things that are negative, the good teachers should be extra rewarded. Yeah. The teachers that hurt children shouldn't be teaching. And right. so parents need to be vigilant. When your child comes home and they're not happy, I think an early assessment. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And This has been a production of Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Check us out at iadhd.org and see how you can help us by donating or by spreading awareness about inattentive ADHD. Thank you.